This is lecture 16 for Chem 223. Thought I would start today's lecture off with another spiritual story. And this one involves genealogy. Not me doing it, because, you know, why would I ever actually do the things the Lord's asked me to do? No, <laughs> this uh, involves me reading in the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord tells uh, Joseph Smith that the great work coming at the end of the world, where uh, Elijah will come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers was a reference to genealogy work and looking back through our past and finding our ancestors. And then when I read that, I thought, hmm, that seems really ridiculous. That uh, I thought it almost seemed too silly to be true. And so in my head, I said that, and, you know, this is, that's just ridiculous. But then, right after saying that in my head, the Spirit confirmed to me that, yes, that is, the, that is the great work that the Lord was talking about. And it's not, uh, it's not the most dramatic story, but uh, it was one that affirmed my testimony and uh, made me believe genealogy work was actually divinely appointed, and someday maybe I'll do it. All right. With that, let's go ahead and get into the lecture material for today. So this lecture is mostly going to be covering Lab 5 and the math behind Lab 5, a little bit of theory as well. Uh, but we're going to be talking about how to do spectroscopy on mixtures, specifically UV-Vis spectroscopy. And uh, we'll talk about how to extract unknown concentrations when you have overlapping signal. Let's start by throwing up the spectrum for one species. So this is the UV-Vis absorption spectrum for one species. We'll just call it species one. This is just a made up species. On the x-axis here, I have the wavelength in nanometers. And on the y-axis, I have our intensity. And the ten intensity is an arbitrary unit. So this would be what the absorption spectrum of a single species looks like. Now let's say that we have a second species, species two, that has an absorption spectrum represented by this red line here. What happens if we have both of these species in our solution together? Well, what we'll get is an absorption spectrum that looks like this. It's both of those two spectrum or spectra added together. So you'll see in parts of this, so I'm gonna highlight our red line right here with the laser pointer. At parts of this, the sum looks just like one species or the other, but in parts of this spectrum, the signal is overlapping. So for example, if we were going to try and measure the concentration of species two just by looking at this single peak right here, eh, we could actually probably do a good job because the peak for species one dies out just before there or right about there. So you might get a small amount of overlap, but not a ton. But this species, or this peak up here for species one, you'll notice the peak is now slightly higher than it was before. Not only is it a little bit higher, but it's actually slightly shifted to the right because of adding uh, this overlapping peak right here. So what do we do in a scenario like this when we have two species and we want to extract useful data? Well, we're going to cover that math right now. So I still have this spectra our spectrum right here with the two overlapping signals. What we're going to do is we're going to, to pick two wavelengths. Now, theoretically, this can be any two wavelengths in your spectrum, but to get the best results with the least amount of uncertainty, you're going to want to pick uh, your, your highest wavelengths or your most intense wavelengths here. And if you have two species, it's best if you can pick a really intense wavelength for each species. So let's pick this first wavelength as the wavelength where species one has its highest intensity absorption. And we'll call this wavelength prime. So when you have a single mark like this, a single apostrophe, that is called prime. And so at wavelength prime, our signal here is actually still following Beer's law. So what we have, if you have multiple species, you just have Beer's Law added together. So what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a path length in here that's B. It's gonna be the same for each species, but the concentration for each species, so exam, for example, right here, I'm highlighting concentration of species X, 
concentration of species Y and concentration of species Z. Those are going to be different for each individual species. You're also going to have different molar absorptivities for each species at each wavelength. So if that's confusing to you, think about this. So for species one, we have this spectrum. For species two, we have this absorption spectrum. And so at this intensity, species X or species one has a much higher absorbance than species two. But if we move over here to this wavelength, species two has a much higher absorbance than species one. So in this equation, all we're doing is adding up Beer's law for all of the species present at wavelength prime. Now, since we only have two species in our experiment, we're actually going to eliminate this Z term. So we're just going to have species X and species Y. Those will still correspond to our species one and species two. Um, but now let's pick a second wavelength. So for this one, we're going to pick a wavelength that is at the maximum wavelength for species two. So we'll just pick this wavelength right here. We'll call this species double prime, or sorry, wavelength double prime. And we'll have a Beer's law equation at that wavelength as well. So in this equation, the things that are going to be different is you're going to have a different absorptivity. So the absorptivity is just what you measure from your instrument. So it'd be this value right here for uh, wavelength prime, and this value right here for wavelength double prime. The path lengths are going to be the same at both wavelengths because that's just the path length or the width of your cuvette. The concentrations of X and Y are going to also be the same. Those actually don't depend on wavelength at all. But your molar absorptivities for each species are also going to be different for each wavelength. So you're just going to have to choose the two best wavelengths. And we would have to know either concentration or molar absorptivities to get useful information out of a plot like this. So if we're trying to measure the molar absorptivity of each species and we knew the concentration of each species, we could figure that out. Or if we knew the molar absorptivity of each species and we're measuring the absorbance in the spectrum, then we can calculate out the X and Y concentrations. So how are we going to measure molar absorptivities in a mixture? Well, we're actually not going to do that. In the lab, in lab five, you'll actually make a calibration curve for each species where you'll start with uh, four different standards, each with a different concentration of that species, and you'll calculate a molar absorptivity for that species at a couple different wavelengths. And then once you get your unknown where it's the two solutions or the two species mixed together at some unknown ratio, you'll already know the molar absorptivity. Okay, so we have these two equations up here. We know the absorptivities for each of these wavelengths from our instrument. This is just our measured value. We know our molar absorptivities of each species at each wavelength because we've measured those previously and we have our path lengths. Now, how do we solve for the concentration of X and the concentration of Y? Okay, when I show you these next equations, I hope that we can still be friends, okay? Please don't hate me or burn an effigy with my picture on it. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to use these two equations right here. So in these equations, obviously the X and Y stand for the concentrations of species X and Y. Now, which species is X and Y is arbitrary. It really doesn't matter. As long as once you assign one species to be species X, the other species is always species Y. And of course the prime and the double prime or the single apostrophe and the double apostrophe refer to the different wavelengths here. And in these equations, everything in here should look familiar to you. We have the absorbance of the first wavelength, the absorbance of the second wavelength. The order of these absorbances actually don't matter either as long as once you assign one wavelength to be wavelength prime, it's always wavelength prime, and the other wavelength is always wavelength double prime. And so you get this big value in the parentheses, or this big equation or expression, and then in this denominator right here, you have a term labeled D. We like to label all our long denominators with a D. So this denominator, you have the way you're gonna solve that, it's the same for both 
uh, equations, it's going to be your path length times all these molar absorptivities multiplied by each other. So something that's interesting about these equations is if you look at the concentration of x when you're calculating that, the values that are in the parentheses here are actually the molar absorptivities of species y at the two wavelengths. And when you're calculating the concentration of species y, uh, the or the molar absorptivity in the parentheses is the molar absorptivity of the species X. And so it seems a little strange, but that is actually how the math works out. So all we're doing in either of these equations is we're taking these two equations, we're solving the top one in terms of X, then we take that value we get for X, substitute it into the second equation for X, and then solve for Y, and vice versa if we're solving uh, for X instead of Y. And I'll give you a chance to practice with these equations in just a second here. Now in lab five, the objective is to learn how to use UV vis spectroscopy to quantify unknown concentrations of two compounds. And the principles we'll learn actually apply to figuring out multiple compounds in a single mixture, but you're not gonna have to do that. Let me introduce the two species we're looking for in lab five. We've got caffeine, which is in most sodas, so it's a pretty interesting species. If you're not in BYU, you'd say it's in your coffee that you drink every day. And it's actually in a few other things. And then we have benzoic acid here. Now, both of these two guys absorb light in the UV-vis spectrum. And why do we expect both of them to absorb light in the UV-vis spectrum? It's because they both have a lot of conjugation in here. Right, they're both conjugated ring systems, and so they're going to be able to absorb light. Their conjugation is different, so their absorptivities or their absorption spectrums are going to look different. Now, why is benzoic acid specifically of interest to us? Uh, the reason is, is because benzoic acid is actually a preservative that's put in soda. Now let's look at the actual absorption spectrum for each of these two guys. So what I have here in this plot on the x-axis is the wavelength. And you'll notice here we're looking at wavelengths between 200 and 300 nanometers. So this is all in the UV region. And so for lab five, we actually have to use a quartz cuvette to uh, record our spectrum because uh, the plastic ones that were used in the previous lab actually absorb UV radiation. So they're transparent in the visible spectrum, but if you could see uh, UV radiation, you would not be able to see the UV radiation through those plastic cuvettes. <clears throat> All right, so what I have in the dashed line on here is the uh, absorption profile of a sample of 8.74 milligrams per liter benzoic acid. You'll notice it has a peak right around here, around 230-ish or 228, somewhere around there. And then it comes down and it has a much tinier peak down here around 270, 275-ish. Okay, so that's the uh, spectrum for benzoic acid. If I look at the spectrum for caffeine, it actually looks somewhat similar. So down at, way, or at lower wavelengths, we have this really tall peak. We actually can't see this tall peak on our instruments. Our instruments actually only go down to about 210 or 215 nanometers. So we can't see this big peak, but as this falls, this really small dotted line for caffeine, you'll notice we actually get a peak for caffeine around the same place as we get for benzoic acid, but here it's kind of overshadowed by this other bigger peak. So benzo or caffeine has an absorbance peak that kind of goes like this, and then a second one that kind of comes up like this, and they're mixed in together, so you can't really resolve that second peak very well. But then caffeine comes back up and around 270, 275-ish, it has another peak and then it falls back down. So if you take Mountain Dew and you put that in the UV vis spectrometer, and so this is a one to 50 dilution of Mountain Dew, your sample actually looks like this. You get a peak right here for benzoic acid around the spot where you'd see it in the pure standard. And this, and this comes down and you get a second peak, you'll notice that this peak is actually in between intensities for the caffeine and for this benzoic acid peak. And so when I said you get a peak over here for benzoic acid, 
that was a little bit misleading because this peak is actually a combination of your caffeine peak and your benzoic acid peak. And the reason this one is in the middle is because it's also a mixture of this benzoic acid peak and the caffeine peak. Because the caffeine then is at a lower concentration, this peak right here around 275 looks a lot lower than the peak you would normally expect from caffeine. And that already tells us something about the concentration of these two species. But then you can also uh, do some math to solve for their concentrations. Now I don't know the real numbers here, but I just made up the numbers I'm going to use on the next couple slides. But let's pick a couple wavelengths here that we can use to analyze these two species in this mixture. We're going to pick one wavelength that corresponds to the maximum absorbance for benzoic acid, and we'll pick our wavelength double prime or our second wavelength to correspond with the maximum absorbance for caffeine. All right, so here is a spectrum collected with two species that absorbance spectra overlap slightly. I've picked two wavelengths for you already. Wavelength prime is going to be at 350 nanometers and wavelength double prime is going to be at 410 nanometers. And you have an absorbance at 350 nanometers of 1.5 and an absorbance at 410 of 1.0. You're going to assume the path length is one centimeter, and I want you to figure out the concentration of each component. Okay, I will throw up some math right here. So here are the equations you'll need to solve this problem. And right here, I have the molar absorptivities of each species. Now looking at this table, this might seem a little confusing at first, so I'll just walk through it. This left column right here is the molar absorptivity for each species at 350 nanometers. So for component X, it's going to have a molar absorptivity of 1,320 at 350 nanometers. And for component Y, it'll have a molar absorptivity of only 177 at 350 nanometers. And then right here, I have the molar absorptivities at 410 nanometers. So for component X, it has a molar absorptivity of 210, and for component Y, it has a molar absorptivity of 1,120 at this wavelength. Okay, I want you now to pause the video, work through this problem, and see if you can figure out the concentration of species X and species Y. All right, let's go through this now, see if you got the same numbers as I did. I'm going to calculate my D value first because that's going to be the same for both species. I have a path length of 1 for this, so I left that off of my expression up here. So in here I have, let's see, I have the molar absorptivity of species X at wavelength prime. So that's going to be at wavelength 350 nanometers. My molar absorptivity there is 1320. And then I'm going to multiply that by my molar absorptivity at wavelength double prime. So that's my molar absorptivity at component Y at my second wavelength, so that's uh, 1120. Then I'm going to subtract my absorptivity of species Y at my first wavelength, so that'll be 177, uh, times my molar absorptivity of species X at my second wavelength. So I got a D value of 1,441,230. If you didn't get that D value, double check that you uh, multiplied everything properly and had everything in parentheses properly, etc. Okay, so for species X then, what we're going to plug in here is for our first absorptivity, our absorptivity at wavelength prime, we had an absorptivity of 1.5. Our absorptivity at wavelength double prime was 1. We're going to multiply this 1.5 by our molar absorptivity of species Y at wavelength double prime, so that's 1120, and we're going to subtract 1 times the molar absorptivity of species Y at wavelength prime, which is 177. So my concentration here for species X is 0 0.00104 molar. I'm going to do the same thing for species Y, calculating its concentration. So it's going to be 1 divided by the D term, which I forgot to mention when calculating X. And then in here, we're going to switch the order of our absorptivities. So up here, we had 1.5 and 1. Down here, we're going to have 1 and 
we're going to take the molar absorptivity of species X at wavelength prime, so that's 1320. And over here, we're going to take the molar absorptivity of species X at wavelength double prime, that'll be 210. So we'll get 0 0.000697 molar. All right, now here is a visual riddle for you. What am I trying to get across from this plus sign and that tool thingy? All right, if you wanna guess, you can keep trying. But what we have here is advice. All right, so this is some advice for working on lab five. The first thing you wanna do is prepare all of your standards in a group. By doing this, you'll cut down the number of standards each individual has to make. So each member of the group should only have to make two or three standards. Next, use the same cuvette for all of your measurements. If you use a different cuvette, the path length might be slightly different. And so if the path length is slightly different than one centimeter, that's not going to actually affect your calculations because that will get consumed up in your calibration curve. You'll actually can calibrate for having a slightly different path length when calculating your molar absorptivities. But if you calibrate using one cuvette that's one length and use a second cuvette for your unknown, then your path length might have just changed slightly and that might be enough to throw off your concentrations. Next, remember to save all of your absorption spectra. In the lab video, there are instructions on how to save your absorption spectra. So make sure to watch that and write those steps down. And if you need help, let me know. The instructions on the lab video will save the files as what's called a CSV or comma separated values file. That does not look like something you can open in Excel, but actually if you open Excel and then just highlight those files and drop them in, Excel will open them up. It'll ask you what you wanna do with the data. If you just hit the finish button, you'll be finished and all of your data will be in Excel. When working on the homework for this assignment, it asks you to use a solver to, or a solver in Excel to figure out these concentrations. Don't do that, just use the equations we went over here and you'll get the right answers. And it'll be a lot easier for you to figure out. All right, now, so uh, since we're dealing with caffeine here, I thought it would be fun to turn to the Doctrine and Covenants and read about the Word of Wisdom and see what it says about caffeine. All right, so this is Doctrine and Covenants, section 89, verses 7 through 9. And again, strong drinks are not for the belly, but for the washing of your bodies. And again, tobacco is not for the body, neither for the belly, and it is not good for man, but is an herb for bruises and all sick cattle, to be used with judgment and skill. And again, hot drinks are not for the body or belly, especially ones that contain caffeine, because they will surely wreck thy sleep. All right, now you might have noticed I edited verse 9 a little bit there. That's because the Doctrine and Covenants never actually mentions uh, caffeine. It mentions hot drinks. So let's talk about the history of caffeine and the word of wisdom. Now this information I'm gonna go over next, I literally stole right from Wikipedia. The last time I checked, which was probably in 2018, Wikipedia had a great word of wisdom uh, article or page, it was very detailed. And so I'm gonna just read you some things that I found on there. In 1918, Frederick J. Pack, a Latter-day Saint professor at the University of Utah, published an article in an official church magazine in which he reasoned that because Coca-Cola contained caffeine, which is also present in tea and coffee, Latter-day Saints should abstain from Coca-Cola in the same way that they abstain from the word of wisdom, hot drinks. Since Pack's article, many Latter-day Saints have come to believe that the reason tea and coffee are prescribed in their presence or is the presence of caffeine in the drinks. However, the church has never stated that this is the reason for the prohibition. Isn't that interesting? So the controversy over caffeine actually started with an article written by a professor, not by any actual church leaders. Let's keep going. In the past, a number of church leaders have discouraged the use of such products. For example, in 1922, church president Heber J. Grant counseled the Latter-day Saints, I'm not going to give any command, but I will ask it as a personal individual favor to me to let Coca-Cola alone. 
There are plenty of other things you can get at the soda fountains without drinking that which is injurious. The Lord does not want you to use any drug that creates an appetite for itself. Now you can decide for yourself what that means and whether or not you should drink Coca-Cola. But interestingly, two years after making this statement, Grant met with a representative of the Coca-Cola company to discuss the church's position on Coca-Cola and at the conclusion of their second meeting, Grant stated that he was sure I have not the slightest desire to recommend that the people leave Coca-Cola alone if the amount of caffeine in Coca-Cola is absolutely harmless, which they claim it is. Grant never again spoke out against the use of cola drinks. That's pretty interesting, actually. Coca-Cola was probably like, hey, stop bad melting our product and went and had a meeting with them. Approximately 50 years later, the church issued an official statement which stated, with reference to cola drinks, the church has never officially taken a position on this matter, but the leaders of the church have advised, and we do now specifically advise against the use of any drink containing harmful habit-forming drugs under circumstances that would result in acquiring the habit. Any beverage that contains ingredients harmful to the body should be avoided. So what I take this to mean personally is that different people have different levels of susceptibility to become addicted to different chemicals, right? And so for some people, caffeine probably is addictive and probably really harmful, but for the vast majority of people, I think that caffeine is not addictive. And you can decide for yourself whether you think it's harmful or whether you want to consume it. Um, but it's really a matter for personal decision and what you think is best for you and your body. So pretty interesting. Now let's go over some notes on caffeine. I'm actually not uh, trying to encourage you guys to stop drinking caffeine or to drink caffeine. I really don't care what you decide on the topic as long as you do what's right or don't give it much thought and just drink what you wanna drink. All right, so excessive use of caffeine may lead to digestive disturbances, constipation, palpitations, shortness of breath, and depressed mental states. It's a possible teratogen. The first time I ever gave this lecture, I said I pronounced that as a teratogen because I was a little bit nervous. It was my first year teaching. Now every time I read teratogen, I almost say teratogen again. All right, some reported effects of caffeine include improved alertness, concentration, energy, clear-headedness, and feelings of sociability. So it makes you a little more friendly can also make it hard to sleep. And some people are, of course, more sensitive than others, especially those with high blood pressure. I'll tell you a story about a missionary on my mission. He drank so much Mountain Dew that he got kidney stones. And so the mission president banned us from drinking soda. But uh, most of us stopped drinking soda after that. But this particular missionary kept drinking tons and tons of Mountain Dew. All right, here's some fun true or false questions for you. True or false, caffeine effects only last two hours. This is actually false. In healthy adults, caffeine's half-life is about 4.9 hours. So that means you should be feeling it for most of that time. Though, of course, this is the half-life where half of the concentration has disappeared, so the effects will stop feeling that intense if you feel them at all. Some people don't feel any effects from caffeine. Other people like myself just feel jittery and can't stop shaking our hands so I don't drink a lot of caffeine. True or false, you don't get withdrawals with caffeine like other chemicals. So this is actually false as well. You can get caffeine withdrawals and they are real, but they're less severe than say methamphetamines where you're scratching at the floor and vomiting for 30 days. And last one, true or false, you can overdose on caffeine. This is actually true. The adult mean lethal dose is approximately 10 grams. So how much soda do you have to drink to die from caffeine? Well, let's figure it out. So this is 10 grams of caffeine to die. Let's see how much caffeine is actually in most cans. So most cans of soda, and this is your milligrams of caffeine. So let's see, I think the highest on here is 50. So this is Pepsi Diet Lime. I actually don't know what year these data are from, so they might be a little out of date. So you get 50 milligrams of caffeine for every can of Pepsi Diet Lime you drink. And so since it takes 10 grams to kill you, let's see, that would mean that it would take 
200 cans of Pepsi Diet Lime soda to kill you from caffeine overdose. Of course, if you drink that much soda, you will probably die from other things first, like from being an idiot. And then for coffee, coffee's concentration of caffeine is actually not much higher than sodas. So from a single cup of coffee, you can get about 95 milligrams of caffeine. So that's about twice as much as the Diet Lime Pepsi and about two or three times more than most other caffeinated beverages. Now, of course, we all know that there is caffeine in chocolate, or if you don't, I'm sorry to inform you that there is, but there's actually not a ton of caffeine. So here are the caffeine levels in several uh, popular candy bars. And then again, these data might be horribly out of date as well. So for example, if you eat a thing of Rolos, you get about three milligrams of caffeine. So the amount of caffeine you get from candy, it's about an order of magnitude less than from a can of soda. So Hershey's Milk Chocolate Bar actually has a little bit of caffeine, about nine milligrams, and their special dark is the highest, at least on this table. And what we've learned from this lecture today is that you can eat roughly 30 candy bars, 30 of these Hershey's Special Dark with, before you get enough caffeine to hurt yourself, or at least to kill yourself. So science has just taught us you can eat as much chocolate as you want. And I've made that joke before, and a professor got onto me for not pointing out that it was a joke. So it's a joke. Don't eat all the chocolate you want. Like the rest of us, you have to be unhappy with the amount of chocolate you are consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll finish this lecture off with a little personal information about myself. So in high school, one of my hobbies when I was bored was I would surf the internet and find uh, gifts and I would download them. And so these are actual gifts that I found in high school. I still have my collection of some 300 gifts that I liked and I downloaded them. This has nothing to do with the class. It will show up on none of your assignments, but now you know that your professor is a little bit of a weirdo. All right, let me know if you have any questions with any of that, except for the part about me being a weirdo.